Şimdi finans merkezleri fiziksel altyapının etkisi isimli oturumumuzla programımıza devam edeceğiz. Konuşmalarını yapmak üzere oturum moderatörü Kalkınma Bakanlığı Müsteşarı Sayın Kemal Madenoğlu'nu, İstanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi Genel Sekreteri ve İstanbul Finans Merkezi Altyapı Komitesi Başkanı Profesör Doktor Adem Baştürk'ü, Fari Öre Palas Genel Müdürü Sayın Arno Döbresu'yu, Dubai Finansal Hizmetler Otoritesi Politika ve Strateji Direktörü ve İslami Finans Başkanı Sayın Peter Casey'yi ve The City UK Deniz Ötesi Strateji Direktörü Sayın Wayne Evans'ı sahneye davet ediyoruz. Evet, e, finans merkezleri altyapının etkisi panelimize hoş geldiniz hepiniz. Tabii bu sıcak konulara ilişkin bir gündemin arkasından daha orta ve uzun vadeli bir konu olan altyapıyı konuşmanın güçlüğünün farkındayım. Ve sıcağın cazibesine, güncelin cazibesine çok da kendimizi kaptırmadan ama önemini de unutmadan daha orta uzun vadeli bakmanın hem son yıllardaki deneyimimiz bunu kanıtladı hem de bu yolda gitmenin daha rasyonel olduğunu düşünüyoruz. Elbette bu güncel olanın öneminden ve etkisinden sıyrılacağız anlamına gelmez. O açıdan Türkiye açısından daha orta uzun vadeli perspektifte İstanbul'un finans merkezi haline gelmesi konusundaki çabalarımızın bir parçası olarak burada özellikle altyapı boyutunu değerli katılımcılarla konuşacağız, sizlerle paylaşacağız. Ben öncelikle finans zirvesinin ikincisini düzenleyen Key Global'a ve 7.24'e çok teşekkür ediyorum. Bizleri davet ettiği için ayrıca teşekkür ediyorum. Bunun dışında İstanbul Finans Merkezi'nin koordinatörlüğünü yürüten bir kişi olarak finans konusundaki son iki yıldır yapılan bu zirvenin bizim çalışmalarımıza çok önemli katkıları olduğunu düşünüyorum. Dolayısıyla bütün emeğe geçenlere tekrar teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Bildiğiniz gibi Türkiye 2023 vizyonu çerçevesinde 2023 için koyduğu ilk 10 ekonomi girme hedefi, ekonominin arasına girme hedefi doğrultusunda İstanbul'un bir finans merkezi haline getirilmesi de bu vizyonun çok önemli parçalarından birisi. Ve bu yöndeki çabalarımız devam ediyor. Son 3 yıldır biliyorsunuz Türkiye olarak bu konuda bir strateji ve eylem planı hazırladık. Ve bunu ciddi bir şekilde takip ediyoruz. Ve Önümüzdeki aylarda özellikle düzenlemelere ilişkin, finans piyasası düzenlemelerine ilişkin, finans merkezi için ortam hazırlamaya yönelik bir paket hazırlığımız da devam ediyor. Fakat bu aşamada özellikle şunu belirtmek istiyorum. Biz bir yandan şu aşamada biliyorsunuz orta vadeli program hazırlıklar içerisindeyiz. Bir yandan bu güncel dünyanın içinde bulunduğu sorunları özellikle Avrupa'nın ve bizlere etkisini e, minimum düzeyde tutacak her türlü tedbiri almaya devam ediyoruz ve önümüzdeki orta vadeli programda da e, bunun e, izlerini e, politikaların ana temalarını göreceksiniz. Bu çerçevede biz tabi eski adıyla Devlet Planlama Teşkilatı yeni adıyla Kalkınma Bakanlığı olarak e, bir yandan güncel ve orta, orta vadeli genel perspektifimizi korurken daha orta uzun vadeli 
e, finans merkezi yönündeki çalışmalarımızı da sürdürüyoruz. Bu çalışmalarımız içerisinde bildiğiniz gibi finans merkezi ne yönelik olarak beş tane temel e, stratejik amacımız var. İstanbul'un finans merkezi haline gelmesi için 2023'te bildiğiniz gibi ilk 10 finans merkezi arasına girmek gibi bir hedefimiz var. Bunun ilk aşamada bölgesel, daha sonra ulusal düzeyde gerçekleşmesine yönelik. Tabi bunlardan birincisi fiziki ve teknolojik ortamın hazırlanması. İkincisi uluslararası standartlarda bir yasal çerçevenin oluşması. Basit ve adil bir vergi sisteminin oluşması. Etkin bir düzenleme ve denetleme çerçevesinin oluşması ve özellikle hem insan kaynağı olarak hem de sosyal yaşam ortamı olarak e, hem Türkiye'nin özellikle de İstanbul'un hazır hale getirilmesi gibi bir hedefimiz var. Fiziksel ve fiziksel altyapının oluşturulması e, anlamında bildiğiniz gibi komiteler oluşturduk her bir alana ilişkin. Bu komitelerden bir tanesi de fiziksel altyapı komitesi ve bunun başkanlığını e, Büyükşehir Belediye'miz yürütüyor ve e, Sayın Genel Sekreterimiz Adem Baştürk bu komitenin başkanlığını yürütüyor. Tabi İstanbul Finans Merkezi gibi her ne kadar ulusal düzeyde başlatılan ve öyle de devam etmesi gereken bir projenin en önemli sahibi olarak biz kamu adına özellikle e, İstanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi'ni görüyoruz. Ve zaten kendiler de bugüne kadar yaptıkları çalışmalarla e, hakikaten İstanbul'un bu manada en önemli vizyonları arasına giren e, İstanbul Finans Merkezi konusunda ciddiyetle konuyu ele alıyorlar. Ben öncelikle kendisinden başlamak istiyorum. Kendisini kısaca isterseniz tanıtayım. Kayserli Adem Bey. E, aynı zamanda akademisyen kökenli. İstanbul Teknik Üniversitesi'nde İnşaat, su, çevre e, konularında e, çalışmaları, doktorası, doçentliği var. E, Adem Bey ilk 94'te İstanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi'nde genel sekreter yardımcısı, daha sonra genel sekreter. Ondan sonra bir parlamento meclis milletvekilliği tecrübesinin arkasından tekrar Büyükşehir Belediyemizde genel sekreter olarak göreve başladı. E, ben başta hakikaten kendilerine çok teşekkür ediyorum bizlere verdikleri destekten dolayı ve panelimizin gündemi çerçevesinde kendisine birkaç tane temel soruyu yöneltmek istiyorum. Birincisi doğal bir süreç içerisinde zaten biliyorsunuz İstanbul'da belli bir potansiyel var. Bu doğal süreç içerisinde eğer kamu merkezi hükümet ya da yerel düzeyde bir özel bir müdahale olmazsa İstanbul İstanbul'un bir finans merkezi olma yolundaki süreci nasıl devam ederdi? Bu soruyu sormaktaki amacım özellikle kamu müdahalesinin ne kadar etkinli, etkili olabileceğini anlamak. İkincisi İstanbul'un genel vizyonu içerisinde finans merkezi olmasının yeri nedir? Büyükşehir Belediyesi'nin oluşturduğu bu çerçevede finans merkezi nasıl bir yer tutuyor? Ve özellikle finans aktörlerinin belli bir alanda kümelenmesinin sizce önemi nedir? Bu çerçeve içerisinde nereye oturuyor? Ve tabii bu genel vizyonun içerisinde e, finans merkezine yönelik özellikle altyapı anlamında, bunun içerisine başlığımızda da var biliyorsunuz ulaştırma, ICT, tüm yaşam kalitesi gibi tüm unsurlar içeriyor. Buna yönelik perspektifiniz nedir? Ne tür çalışmalar yapmayı planlıyorsunuz? Buyurun Adem Bey. Nasıl rahat hissediyorsanız. Peki buyurun. Bir 15 dakika süre veriyoruz. Zamanımız kısıtlı. Özellikle e, ikinci konuşmacımız ayrılmak durumunda. U uçuşu var. Saat 6.30'da ayet. Evet. Ben Sayın Müsteşarımıza, Sayın Başkanımıza teşekkür ediyorum. Ben tüm katılımcılar da, katılımcılar da hoş geldiniz diyor. Saygılar sunuyorum. Tabii biraz önce de Müsteşarımızın ifade ettiği gibi Türkiye'de gelişen ekonomi yeni açılımları gerektirdi. Bunlardan bir tanesi de İstanbul'un 
kısa vadede bölgesel, uzun vadede e, ulusal bir uluslararası e, finans merkezine dönüştürülmesi, bunun için hazırlıklarının yapılması. Tabi e, Sayın Müsteşarım e, sorular yönetti. Aslında ben e, bu soruları da PDRP ile cevaplandıracağım konuşmamın içerisinde. E, Tabi Tabi doğal süreçte nasıl gelişir İstanbul Finans Merkezi? Finans Merkezi'nin yeri nasıl planlanıyor? Galiba öyle değil. Kümelenme nasıl olur? İşte bu altı perspektifi nasıl görüyorsunuz? Tabi biliyorsunuz aslında İstanbul'un fiziksel planlamasını İstanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi yapıyor esas itibariyle. İstanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi Yine hükümetimizin temel politikasına uygun olarak 2023 yılını hedef alan bir çevre düzeni, İstanbul çevre düzeni planı diye bir plan yapıyor. Bu aslında bir yerde İstanbul şehrinin şehircilik açısından anayasası. Bu, ana, bu, bu hazırlanan, 2023 yılını hedef alan bu hazırlanan çevre düzeni planında İstanbul'un kısa vadede biraz önce ifade ettiğimiz gibi bölgesel finans merkezi ve uzun vadede de uluslararası finans merkezi hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yine bu biz şeyde 2003 2023 vizyonunda çok temel hedeflerden bir tanesi özgün kültürel ve doğal kimliğini koruyarak gelişen küresel ölçekte rekabet, rekabet gücüne sahip yaşam kalitesi yüksek bir İstanbul. Hedeflenen şey bu 2023 planında veya İstanbul eee çevre düzeni planında. Tabii bu plan çerçevesinde İstanbul şu anda belli bölgelerde finans merkezleri kümelenmiş. Bunlardan bir tanesi Şişli, Mecidiyeköy, Maslak hattı. Aslında bütün büyük merkez orada. Ama bu plan çerçevesinde biraz önce söylediğim çevre düzeni planı çerçevesinde bu artı şehirle bütünleşen başka merkezlerde de dağılmak gibi bir plan yapılmış. Bunlardan da Asya yakasında Ataşehir, kısa vadede biraz daha uzun vadede Kartal ve yine Avrupa yakasında Basın Ekspres çevresi ve uzun vadede Silivri çevresinde e, finans merkezleri ve bu türlü yapıların yoğunlaştığı merkezde oluşturmak şeklinde planlanmış. Şey bu, vizyonu bu. Ve tabi bu merkezler sadece bir merkez değil, bu merkez çerçevesinde orada fuar alanları, eğlence alanları, e, spor tesisleri falan gibi tüm altyapının olduğu bir merkez olarak planlanıyor. Ve tabi bize verilen bu görev çerçevesinde biraz önce de Sayın Müsteşarım ifade ettiği gibi altyapı komitesine verilen görev İstanbul'un bu vizyon çerçevesinde kısa vadede ve uzun vadede bu hedefe ulaşmak için ne olması lazım? Ne türlü altyapı eksiklikleri var? Neleri eksikte tamamlaması gerekir gibi biz çalışmaya başlattık biz bu çerçevede. Ve çalışmanız o yönde yoğunlaştı. Ve bunu yaparken de tabii bu sektörün içerisinde olan kurumlar, kuruluşlar ve onların temsilcileri, bankalar, işte, e, finans kuruluşları, e, sigortalar, sigorta temsilcileri falan gibi kurumlarla istişareler yaptık ve onlara onlara bağlı olarak bir bir yol aramaya çalıştık. Şimdi tabii hedef bu olunca o zaman biz bu hedefi sadece kısa vadede şey değil kısa vadede ulaşmak için tabi sadece alt şey altyapı olarak sadece bildiğimiz klasik ulaşım altyapısı, iletişim altyapısı değil altyapısı olarak tarif ettiğimiz kısımlar ulaşım, eğitim, sağlık, güvenlik gibi daha geniş bir kapsamda görev aldık. Böyle olunca İstanbul acaba mevcutta nedir? Nelerimiz var? Bunları bir incelemek gerekiyor. 
Bunlardan baktığımızda ben birkaç tane rakamla size ifade edersem. Bunlardan bir tanesi diyoruz ki ofis gördüğümüzde yani bizim bu arama konferansları ve e, bu banka temsilcileri veya işte biraz önce finans kurumu temsilcilerini aldığımız bilgilerin başında tabi bunlar yerli yabancı kuruluşlar var. Ofis ihtiyaçları var. İstanbul'da şu anda işte biraz önce söylediğim Maslak, Ataşehir ve havaalanı çevresinde yaklaşık 3 milyon metrekare ofis potansiyeli var. Ofis rezervi var. Bu bunu bu ofis rezervini ücretler açısından değerlendirdiğinizde bir, bir çalışmada e, uluslararası bir çalışmada İstanbul e, ofis açısından ofis fiyatları açısından yaklaşık 7.760 dolar yıllık maliyeti var bir ofisin ofis zannediyorum 300 metrekare falan ifade ediyorlar mesela yine o tabloda Tokyo'ya bakıyorsunuz birinci sırada 22.000 dolar civarında. 10. sırada olan Singapur'a bakıyorsunuz aşağı yukarı 16 bin dolar civarında. Dolayısıyla İstanbul nispi olarak fiyatlar açısından bir avantaj oluşturuyor. Ama buna karşılık e, yeteri derecede birinci sınıf diyebileceğimiz ofis mevcut olmadığı için biz nakısa demek ki yapılacak işlerden bir tanesi bu birinci sınıf dediğimiz uluslararası şirketlerin gelip görev alabileceği ofis sayısını, ofis e, şeyini artırmak ofis e, alanını artırmak. Birinci yapılacak işlerden bir tanesi bu. Yine bir, bir uluslararası çalışmada e, Avrupa'da 20, 20, 27 şehir alınmış ve karşılaştırılmış. Bunlar içerisinde e, gayrimenkul alımına ve girişme beklentilerine göre İstanbul birinci sırada yer alıyor. Ve mevcut e, yatırım performansına göre de ikinci sırada gösterilmiş. Münih'le birlikte. Yine İstanbul'un altyapısı açısından değerlendirdiğimizde İstanbul'u son yıllarda 7 milyon turist ziyaret ediyor, ziyaret etmiş. Bu yine İstanbul'da mevcut altyapı olarak 1151 tane konaklama tesisi var. Bunun, bunun bu konaklama tesislerinin kapasitesi 110 bin yatak. Ve İstanbul son zamanda biliyorsunuz uluslararası e, konferansta çok önemli bir mesafe kat etti. İstanbul'da 2010 yılında 109 uluslararası konferans düzenlenmiş. Ve bu sonuçta da dünyada 7. sayı yükselmiş. Uluslararası konferans düzenleme açısından. Tabii tüm hizmet sektörü yanında, tabii finans sektörü için de yetişmiş insan gücü önemli bir hadise. Ve bu yetişmiş insan gücünü yetiştirecek üniversite sayısı da İstanbul'da önemli, özellikle son zamanlarda önemli bir mesafe kat, edin, kat etti. Şu anda 9 resmi, 33 tane de vakıf üniversitesi olmak üzere toplam 42 tane üniversite var İstanbul'da. Ve tabi e, uluslararası e, çalışacak insanların e, tabi başka bir eklentisi de eğlence ihtiyaçları. İstanbul'da bu bakımdan önemli bir mesafe almış. İstanbul'da yeme, içme, alışveriş, kültür, yaşam, eğlence olarakları da İstanbul sunmakta. Ve yine bir başka çalışma, The Guardian yapmış bu çalışmayı. Avru İstanbul, Avrupa'nın yeni eğlence başkenti tayin etmiş. Yine Financial Times'a göre de en iyi yaşanabilir şehirler arasında anketinde İstanbul dünyanın yaşanabilir en iyi, şehir, en iyi şehir, şehri seçmiş. Bu da İstanbul açısından önemli bir önemli bir e, ilerleme olarak e, şey edebiliriz, sayabiliriz. Tabii yine altyapı olarak bir başka parametre saydığımızda İstanbul'da 63 milyon kapasiteli iki tane havaalanı var. Bu havaalanından 395 bin uçuş yapılıyor ve geçen sene itibariyle de 43 milyon yolcu taşınmış ve yine İstanbul'un son nüfusu 13 milyon yaklaşık bu civarda ve burada da taşınan yolcu sayısı 24 milyon günde. Tabii kendisi yolculukları aldığınızda, taleplerini aldığınızda bunun yüzde 83'ü karayolla yapılıyor. Bunun yüzde 13'ü de raylı sistemlerle yapılıyor. Metro ve diğer raylı sistemler. Ancak yüzde 3'ü deniz sistemiyle. 
Ama ancak İstanbul'da çok son zamanlarda hızlı bir metrolaşma ve raylı sistem inşaatları var. E, 2014'te bunların çoğu bitiyor ve böyle olunca da şu anda 150 kilometre raylı sistem ağımız 280 kilometreye çıkıyor. Ve böylece e, raylı sistemin e, şeydeki payı, toplu aşımdaki payı önemli bir miktar artacak. 130 civarına çıkacağını hesaplıyoruz bu 2014'ten sonra. Ve e, biraz önce yine müsteşarımın sorusuna da söylersek eğer, tabii e, yine yaptığımız araştırmalarda İstanbul için görünen en büyük eksiklik aslında e, toplu taşımadaki trafik ve toplu taşımadaki rail sistem eksikliği, metro ve diğer benzerleri. Aslında biliyorsunuz dünyada yani rail sistemlerin ilk başlayanlardan bir tanesi biziz. Biliyorsunuz 1800 yıllarda tünel yapmışız. Öyle kalmış. Bundan sonra uzun bir süre durmuş. Yeni başlıyor bu rail sistemler. Tabii bu şu anda yani 2014'te 280 kilometre deseniz bu yine İstanbul açısından oldukça düşük bir değer. Ee, ve biz yapış devleti devleti de dahil çeşitli modelleri kullanarak tabii bir de şu an bir geçen sene bir kanun daha çıktı. Ulaştırma Bakanlığı da artık İstanbul'da rail sistem yapacak, metro yapacak. 2023 yılı hedefimiz de 640 kilometrelik bir rail sisteme ulaşmak olarak planlanıyor. Bu hedef bu hedefe ulaşmamak için de bir sebep de görmüyorum. Son zamanda yine toplu ulaşım için yaptığımız biliyorsunuz yeni bir sistem metro metrobüs sistemi. O da yani e, önemli bir e, toplu ulaşıma katkı sağlıyor. Tabii İstanbul'un yani yine e, çok önemli bir yatırım daha var. E, Türkiye Çit diye isimlendirilen raylı sistemle İstanbul'un iki yakasını birleştiren sistem. Bu da e, raylı sistem ve e, yani Türkiye Çit ve e, diğer e, mevcut hattın geliştirilmesiyle birlikte 76 kilometrelik bir hat bu ve 2,8 milyar dolara mal oluyor. Bu da bu da biliyorsunuz ray geçişleri yani tünel falan da açıldı, raylar da ödeşendi. Biraz ilave hatlarda problem var. Ee, bu da 76 kilometre 2014 yılında bitiyor ve böylece İstanbul'un iki yakası raylı sistemle birleşmiş oluyor. Bu da yani ileri dönük olarak e, önemli bir altyapı eksikliğini karşılıyor. Yine İstanbul'da bir başka geçiş daha var. Yapışta devlet olarak bu ihale edildi Ulaştırma Bakanlığı tarafından. Yine e, İstanbul'un Kazlı Çeşme ile Göztepe'yi birleştiriyor. Bu da e, lastik tekerlekli bir sistem bu. Bu yani yaklaşık 100 saat, 100 dakikayı bulan yolculuğu 15 dakika indiriyor. Bunun da bedeli 1,1 milyar dolar. Bu da yapışta devlet projesi. Tabii ne finans sisteminin e, finans sisteminde görev alacak özellikle uluslararası insanların e, önemli beklentileri de kendi ailelerinin, çocuklarının eğitimi. Bu çerçevede de İstanbul'da 11 yabancı okul var. 6 tane de uluslararası okul. 14, 14 tane de uluslararası bakalör programı uygulanan okul var. Bunların hepsi uluslararası diploma veriyor. Bu da ancak bu tabii hala da geliştirilmesi ve bu sayının artırılması gerekiyor edindiğimiz bilgilere göre. Şimdi İstanbul'da tabii altyapıdan sayıldığı için e, sağlık sektörü de önemli bir yerde. E, 217 hastane var İstanbul'da, 20 bin yatak var. E, pardon 20 bin hekim, 26 bin yatak var. Ve İstanbul'da son zamanlarda sadece şey değil, sadece Türkiye değil, uluslararası e, sağlık talebi de var, tedavi talebi de var. 2011 yılında 45 bin hasta sağlık turizmi kapsamında yurt dışına tedavi için gelmiş İstanbul'a. Bu da yani bu da önemli bir rakam. Tabii yine altyapı içinde sayılan suç ve güvenlik istatistiklerine göre de İstanbul dünyada güvenli şehirlerden bir tanesi. Bu da işte biliyorsunuz 2005'ten beri yapılan MOBESE kameraları çok yaygın bir şekilde İstanbul'da kullanılıyor. <gülüyor> ee, ve 1179 noktada 4127 kamera var ve 412'de trafik kamerası var. Böylece bunlar 24 saat çalışıp ve çok da güzel hizmetler yapıyor. Tabii bu bu biraz önce söylediğim rakamlar İstanbul'un mevcut hali. Biz komisyon olarak ne yaptık, ne yapıyoruz, ne yapacağız? Başta ifade ettiğim gibi verilen bize görev çerçevesinde biz Kendi içimizde de komisyonlar oluşturduk, istas komisyonlar oluşturduk. Bunlar 
Kümelenme, ofis, konut ve konaklama. İkincisi ulaşım, bilgi, iletişim teknolojileri ve enerji. Üçüncüsü eğitim, doğru, sağlık, güvenlik, doğal afetler gibi altı, alt komisyon kurduk. Bu da bunun burada çeşitli kurumlardan temsil edilen arkadaşlardan oluşan bir şey. Kümelenme, ofis e, ve konaklama e, çalışma grubu İFM yapılanma modelinin nasıl uygulanması gerektiği üzerine çalışıyor. Farklı modellere göre konut ve konaklama ihtiyacını tespit ediyor. Benzer şekilde ulaşım, bilgi, iletişim teknolojide teknoloji eksiklikler nasıl yapmak lazım, nasıl finanse etmek lazım, ne eksiklerimiz var bunları e, şey diyor, e, çalışıyor. Yine eğitim ve sağlık şeyleri de, e, grupları da benzer şekilde yine İstanbul'da eksikler neler, uluslararası standartta erişmemiz için neler yapmamız gerekiyor, nasıl finanse etmemiz gerekiyor. Bu konuda e, çalışıyor. Güvenlik de benzer şekilde. Bunlar bir başka grubumuz doğal afetler. Bütün bunlar bu çerçevede yapılıyor. Ve biz e, bir senede beri çalışıyoruz ve biz bunu bir eylem planına dönüştürüp rapor aldık. Sümbük Kalkınma, Bak e, Kalkınma Bakanlığımıza. Oradan ileri dönük olarak bu çerçevede çalışmalarımız devam ediyor. Tabi meseleyi daha iyi tanımak açısından anket çalışmalarımız var. İşte biraz daha yani sistemi tanımak ve e, sistemin önünü açmak açısından e, ve biraz önce ifade ettiğim gibi eylem planı hazırlandı, sunuldu. Eylem planında önümüzdeki günlerde ihtiyaçlarını karşılayacak, biraz önce de söyledim, anketler, fiziksel koşulların sağlanması adım atılacak ve e, eylem planları yapılacak ve bu çalışma bu şekilde devam edecek. Sonuçta şöyle özetleyebilirim. Demek ki aslında İstanbul Finans merkezi olma yanında önemli altyapı eksiklerini önemli bir kısmı tamamlamış aslında. Çok önemli eksiklik olan görülen şey e, raylı sistemlerdeki eksiklik. Bu da başta ifade ettiğim gibi hem Ulaştırma Bakanlığı hem e, İstanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi hem de işte yapışlet devlet gibi başka modellerle e, bunun e, şeyi çalışılıyor. E, tabii yine ben son soruları da şey ederek cevaplanmış olarak şey diyeyim. Tabii kümelenme kendiliğinden oluşuyor. Başta ifade ettiğim gibi masa katı bir kümelenmedir. Eee basın ekspres hattı bir kümelenmedir. Kendiliğinden oluşuyor ama bunun yanında planlayarak yaptığımız şeyler de var. Biliyorsunuz Ataşehir de kamu bankalarının planlama çerçevesine girip yerleşeceği bir yerdir. O da sonuçta planlama sonuçunda gidilen bir yerdir. Demek ki hem kümelenme hem bizatihi kendisi oluşuyor hem de planlamak, yönlendirilerek de bunlar sağlanabiliyor. Ee, tabii doğal süreci çok fazla da bırakmamak gerekiyor. Ee, çünkü onu planlamak gerekiyor. Onun tabii bir şey yapmak yetmiyor. Onun işte ulaşım altyapısını, iletişim altyapısını, işte sağlıktır, ofistir, e, işte güvenliktir gibi altyapısını birlikte planlamak gerekiyor. Tabii bir şey oluştuktan sonra bu, onu onu yapmak daha zor olabilir ama baştan planlarsanız belki bunu daha sağlıklı, daha çabuk, daha seri e, bitirebilirsiniz diye düşünüyorum. Ben e, daha fazla şey uzatmadan ben e, dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ederim. Hepinizi saygı kastırıyorum. Bir soru olursa cevaplanacak. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz e, Adem Beyciğim. Şimdi vakit kaybetmeden e, ikinci konuşmacımız Ahmet Debrason'a e, söz vereceğim. Biliyorsunuz Bay Brason e, 93 yılından beri Europlace'in e, genel müdürlüğünü yapmakta. E, Bay Brasson üst düzey profesyonel çalışanların yanı sıra özellikle mali piyasasındaki Fransız ve uluslararası ihracatçıları, yatırımcı bankaları ve finansal kurumlar gibi e, büyük oyuncuları bir araya getirmekteler. Aynı zamanda Bay Brasson 2003 yılında kurulan Institute Europe Place de Finance'in ve 2007 yılında kurulan Paris Uluslararası Finansal Hizmetler e, Birliği'nin de genel müdürü kendisi. E, ben fazla uzatmadan kendisine sözü vereceğim. Ama benim de e, kendi tasarladığı konuşmasına eklemesini isteyeceğim birkaç sorum var. Bunlardan birincisi <gülüyor> e, La Defense e, merkezi nasıl bir e, süreçte ortaya çıktı? Biraz önce Sayın Baştürk'e sorduğum soru çerçevesinde bu süreçte kendi doğal gelişimi neydi? E, ve burada 
e, merkezi hükümetin ya da yerel yönetimin, Paris Belediyesi'nin bu merkezin oluşmasında ne tür etkileri oldu? İkincisi, bu süreçler içerisinde bu ilgili firmaları buralarda toplama konusunda bir özel teşvik mi uygulandı? Bunun sürecini biraz açarsa sevinirim. Özellikle buranın oluşmasındaki altyapı hazırlıkları ve zaman içerisinde ne tür alanlar kendileri için temel bir çalışma alanı oldu? Hangi alanlar kendilerine e, zorluk çıkaran alanlar olarak ortaya çıktı? Bu konuda e, birikimlerini bizlerle e, paylaşırlarsa çok mutlu oluruz. İkincisi yine bu yönde, bu birikimleri doğrultusunda İstanbul için e, önerileri nelerdir? Teşekkür ediyorum. Well, first, uh, I would like to, to thank very much uh, Mr. Madenoglu for his uh, invitation to come uh, once again to participate to this uh, very impressive forum in uh, Istanbul uh, as a Paris Euro place. Euro place. Uh, we are a little bit in the center of the battle today concerning the future of the Eurozone and I I've been positively impressed by the comments of the chief economist of Citigroup that the recovery will come quite shortly in two years now. So I'm a little bit more optimistic than I was before the speech. Um, we, but I will not elaborate uh, today about uh, the Eurozone issues, but uh, uh, I will elaborate on the subject and on the questions that you have asked concerning uh, the way uh, um, Paris and Istanbul uh, uh, financial center could uh, share some ideas and experiences concerning uh, the question of the development of the infrastructures, the physical infrastructures, which are a, a key uh, priority in the development of the financial center. And I will make my message quite uh, shortly and uh, focus on the three uh, main elements. I don't come back on the key uh, assets for a competitive financial center dynamic financial markets, economic growth and development. The question of the physical infrastructures is a, a key uh, element. And um, as representative of uh, the financial marketplace organization, uh, we are not the city of Paris, uh, our objective and the strategy that we have to implement is to organize the best interaction uh, between all the different indicators concerning the financial center activities, the financial market, the general environment. And Mr. Madenoglu, you were asking the question, what is the role of the public authorities? Our conviction, but I think that the city of London has the same experience, is that we have to combine the action of uh, the market professionals and the public authorities to go in the same direction and make that the, the public authorities, the government, the local authorities consider the development of the financial center like uh, one of the priorities for the city and for the country. Uh, this is uh, the most recent uh, Xinhua uh, Dow Jones Index ranking concerning the international financial centers in the world. And the, the key issue to organize this combination in our view is to uh, organize um, an ambitious strategy and a good governance. One of uh, the main characteristics of our organization, and this is my first message, is that since uh, the creation uh, of Paris Europlace uh, 12 years ago, uh, we have um, put together in our organization all the market players, not only the financial institutions, banks and brokers, but also the institutional investors, the corporates, the corporates which are active market players and because the objective of the financial industry, like uh, Mr. Um, Shalayan was explaining this morning, is to serve the economy and the real economy. So put together 
all the, the, the actors, politics, regulators, companies and issuers, investors and intermediaries to uh, fix the objective and to create a concrete process to uh, develop uh, the financial uh, center in uh, terms of structures and services, in terms of innovation and research, in terms of entrepreneurial innovation, and also in terms of uh, industrial development. Uh, concretely, the actions uh, to develop uh, working groups, think tanks, to push reforms, both on domestic issues, tax and duties, regulation, incentives, this is your question, I will come back to that, modernization of markets, and on international level, uh, for us on European level, for accelerating, and it is our objective to accelerate the European integration, including to make solutions, to find solutions to the present crisis, and on the international level, to participate and discuss on the G20 issues, on the Basel III, the new regulation, regulatory issues uh, coming from the crisis and which are key issues for the future of the financial uh, sector. Uh, second, uh, develop international promotion and cooperations. Um, we uh, have uh, developed um, international cooperations, uh, mostly since the financial crisis, with uh, key uh, markets in the world, with, uh, with China, with Shanghai, with uh, Moscow, in Russia, with uh, Gulf countries, Dubai. Um, I welcome the representative of Dubai Financial Center uh, with uh, Qatar, and uh, we are uh, discussing some issues here in Istanbul. And third, a uh, very important topic, research and innovation through uh, financial clusters. I will come back also on that point. So second message, um, what are the priorities today in terms of physical infrastructures? Um, a representative of the city of uh, Istanbul uh, has uh, spoken about many of uh, these uh, subjects easy access to markets, customers or clients here on the domestic level, but also on the regional and on the international level, to competitive market infrastructures, third, domestic and international transport facilities, fourth, the quality of telecommunications, five, availability of office space, six, research and innovation, seven human resources and finally regulatory and fiscal environment. I will pick uh, just one or two points in these uh, different fields. Easy access to market customers or cli clients is the question of the location of the financial center in a geographical area for us in the European market, which is uh, today as big as important economically than the US market and organize the best facilities in terms of infrastructures and offer the wide range of financial market products. Um, we would like to talk here in Istanbul about bond markets, which will be one important priority after the financial crisis and uh, about uh, the financial instrument for the future taking the lesson of the financial crisis and see how to develop more transparency and liquidity, including through uh, physical platforms uh, for the secondary markets. Competitive market infrastructures, uh, this is the key of uh, the competitiveness of the financial centers. I'm talking about uh, stock exchange facilities, but also post-market facilities, clearing and settlement, market infrastructures, are a condition for an efficient capital marketplace and a priority um, in the present context with the new regulations and market practices. And we have to uh, consider and organize uh, the good balance between regulated platforms with more transparency, adapted to a category of investors and the um, OTC market. Um, which is an, another important uh, actor on the international markets. Uh, your governor uh, was talking about that um, in his um, speech uh, in the beginning of the afternoon, how to organize a good balance, taking the lessons of the financial crisis about the development of uh, regulated markets and the OTC uh, markets. Uh, we have, uh, as uh, Paris Europlas, a, a quite strong experience in these fields, 
because of our participation in the international NYC uh, Euronext uh, stock exchange, which is the number one in the world, and also the development of uh, some uh, post-market facilities in Paris. Domestic and international transport facilities, I understand that the key issue here is about uh, railways facilities and transportation facilities. We have put uh, with the city of Paris, but also with uh, the French government, a very strong emphasis since years on this question, both on domestic infrastructures, including city of Paris, but also France, through uh, the Roissy uh, CDG airport, which is um, today uh, number two in the world uh, as uh, the largest um, and the largest continental hub in terms of airport transportation. We have put uh, much investment on high-speed railway to organize uh, the communication between Paris and other European cities. And we also have put many emphases, much emphasis on the metro lines in Paris including with a new connection between La Défense, and you were talking about La Défense district and the airport on one side and the other uh, great Paris uh, business centers to offer um, uh, more efficient facilities. This is uh, the answer to your questions concerning La Défense project, which is part of uh, what we call the Great Paris project. And the issue today is to try to put together the different locations of uh, economic and financial locations, La Défense, but also center of Paris and uh, the Bercy uh, area, which is a, a new uh, area in terms of implementation of activities and organize the best uh, communications between the different areas and attract international um, companies. Uh, La Défense is today uh, the biggest center to attract uh, international big financial institutions which need uh, efficient uh, buildings, very efficient buildings and the infrastructure facilities. And we uh, have uh, implemented big uh, towers and La Défense is today at the first uh, level of uh, international standards to welcome international companies. But we also have some s other specific facilities for uh, welcoming um, um, subsidiaries or, or smaller uh, fund management companies or high-tech companies which are more interested to be in the center of Paris and, uh, and participate to, to the cluster of uh, their clients in the center of Paris. About uh, your questions concerning these incentives, uh, we have uh, incentives concerning uh, fiscal facilities to participate to the French and the European market from Paris. We have uh, some fiscal incentives for international skills coming to Paris in terms of uh, replication of uh, the non-DOM uh, status which was uh, applied in, in London. And uh, we have also some specific incentives in terms of uh, companies uh, developing uh, new uh, high-tech um, um, um, activities in Paris, mostly in terms of uh, credit, uh, uh, credit for research uh, investment. Telecommunications, this is a key issue also in terms of financial marketplace. Um, in that field, um, our priority in terms of Paris City uh, has been uh, the development of uh, high-speed internet connection. 100% uh, percent of uh, Great Paris is uh, today covered with a high-speed internet connection and 80% uh, will be covered by 2012 with very high speed facilities. It is one of our priorities. Second priority is the development of uh, the TIC, technological te te telecom and uh, internet uh, companies uh, in, uh, in Paris. Availability of office uh, space. Um, this is uh, an important issue. We are uh, quite uh, well equipped uh, um, by us, but it's um, one field on which we could also develop um, and, and, and share our ideas and experiences. I have heard the capacities which exist in Istanbul. Question is to uh, develop uh, um, facilities on with international standard capacities and to offer, let's say, cheap 
um, possibilities to uh, international companies which are looking for their implementation. Financial research and innovation, just to mention that um, this is also a critical point and uh, we believe that uh, Turkey uh, is well equipped with uh, universities, research centers. We know that we have, uh, you have put um, uh, much priority on that, including on the risk management issues, for example. And we believe that uh, we could uh, share more experience and cooperation between our uh, universities and uh, research centers. We have uh, implemented for us what we call a financial services cluster to put together academics and market professionals and work first on research issues and develop new capacities, mostly in risk management and development of new financial instruments for the future. And on the other side, to um, welcome and uh, accompany the development of SMEs, uh, both in the financial sector and uh, also in the industrial sector and create new capacities because one of uh, the consequence of the financial crisis will be the difficulties of SMEs to, to find some uh, financing. So we are working on that issue. Finally, um, I would uh, like to conclude now very shortly uh, on uh, human resources, but we are a little bit apart from uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, talk about uh, the development of uh, universities and high schools. Um, we uh, have uh, also some uh, experience to share in this issue. The key issue uh, for us should be to develop more partnerships, more cooperations between our universities and schools here in Turkey and uh, in uh, France and in Europe. And finally, about the regulatory and fiscal environment, uh, create a, a welcoming, a friend, a friendly environment to welcome uh, activity in industrial uh, financial services activities and uh, organize uh, the good balance between investors protection that we have uh, to consider more than in the past and the efficiency of uh, the financial market. This wa this, that was the main messages that I wanted to, to make here. Uh, we, would like, we would be more than uh, happy to develop uh, a strong cooperation with uh, this wonderful project of uh, Istanbul Financial Center, which uh, for us is a, is a very important project in a very dynamic country today. Thank you very much. Evet, biz teşekkür ediyoruz Baybreson'a. Baybreson ayrılacağı için eğer kendisine özel soru sormak isteyen varsa e, o soruları alıp daha sonra kendisini uğurlamak istiyorum. Buyurun. Merhaba, adım Turşu Ataklıoğlu, BBC Türkçe bölümü için çalışıyorum. Ee, beni duyabiliyor musunuz? Sesim çıkıyor. Ee, finans adı üstünde finans merkezi kuracaksanız eğer, e, İstanbul'un çekici e, olduğu noktalar ne? E, finans, finansı çekebilmek açısından, parayı çekebilmek açısından sizce dışarıdan baktığınızda nasıl görüyorsunuz? Teşekkürler. Başka soru var mı? Hep birlikte cevap verebilir. Evet, yok. Buyurun, Baybreson. I, I think we we already spoke from the subject of last year uh, when we were talking about uh, what um, factors for the attractiveness of financial centers. The first uh, big factor for Istanbul uh, is. Uh, the, the development of Turkey as a very dynamic emerging economy, uh, which is a background of the financial sector activity and uh, with uh, the different uh, strengths that have been mentioned this morning, good stability in terms of uh, um, government expenditures, uh, good stability in terms of uh, monetary policy and um, good um, and uh, 
stronger emphasis on the, the, the, the way to preserve um, uh, equilibrium in the, in the, in the global uh, macroeconomic uh, um, factors for, for the coming years. Second, um, we have um, discussed since uh, some uh, months about the project of uh, Istanbul as a financial center. We know that uh, much progress has been done on the regulation of the markets, which is uh, the first step in terms of developing an efficient and competitive financial marketplace. We know that the uh, regulatory authorities here in Turkey are considering uh, uh, very strongly the question of the transparency, the question of the investors' protection uh, on capital markets, stock markets, but also in the banking supervision. And uh, we think that uh, you know, interesting steps have already been done. We, we, um, we cooperate in that field um, between the French uh, AMF, the Market Authority, the Market, Reg Market Regulatory Authority of France, and the Turkish Authority, and we, we, we believe that uh, we have to, to continue in that field. Um, we know that um, uh, Turkish banks are today interesting market players, and uh, I, I must say um, strong competitors, including for French banks here. We have understand that uh, the government, the Turkish government, has uh, given a high priority to give uh, more focus to the private sector to encourage privatization, knowing that uh, it couldn't be also a very uh, structural step to develop an efficient uh, financial center activity, both on the questions of the efficiency of the market players and on the way to develop um, uh, capital markets for the future. And uh, um, one point on which we could be interested to go further and uh, to, co to conclude, because the time is short, uh, should be to analyze uh, with Istanbul how to uh, organize a better uh, attractiveness and position for international market players. We believe that, uh, like in London 20 years ago, like in Paris 10 years ago, we have to consider that the, the development uh, of the implementation of international market players is also one key issue for the competitiveness of the financial center. Teşekkür ederiz, Baybrason. Ee, sanıyorum Baybrason ayrılmak durumunda. Ben izninizle kendisini uğurlamak istiyorum. Daha sonra e, devam edeceğiz. Kendisine tekrar çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Alkışlarınızla uğurlamak istiyorum. Fiziksel altyapı konusundaki panelimizin üçüncü e, konuşmacısı Bay Peter Casey. Kendisi Dubai Finansal Hizmetler Kurumu İslami Finans Bölüm Başkanı, aynı zamanda Politika ve Strateji Direktörü. Kendisi 2002 yılında ilk olarak Dubai, Finans, Dubai Finansal Hizmetler Kurumu'nda sigortacılık müdürü olarak başladı. 2007 yılında politika direktörü olarak atandı ve 2009 yılında ise İslam, e, İslami Finans Başkanı oldu. E, buraya katılmadan önce kendisi İngiltere'de Finansal Hizmetler Kurumu'nda e, çalıştı. Orada dış sigorta başkanlığı yaptı. Ve daha sonra Hazine Müsteşarlığı Ticaret ve Sanayi Dairesi'nde e, görevlerde bulundu. E, kendisine diğer panel üyelerimize e, sorduğum soruların e, benzeri bir soru, soruyla başlamak istiyorum. Öncelikle tabi Dubai'ye gitmeden önce ve gittikten sonra bir tabi finans sektöründen birisi olarak ne bekliyordu, ne ile e, karşılaştı? Bu manada <gülüyor> İstanbul konusunda düşünceleri nedir? Ve bir dış gözlemci, örneğin bir finans sektörünün CEO'su olarak 
e, böyle bir finans merkezinden bir CEO'nun beklentisi özellikle altyapı anlamında neler olabilir? <gülüyor> Farklı deneyimleri ışığında e, kendi hazırladığı sunuşa ilave olarak bu soruları da cevaplamasını arz ediyoruz. Buyurun. Bay Casey. Okay, I'll try and cover some of this. First, uh, I am so grateful to everyone for risking death by PowerPoint this late in the afternoon that I'm going to try something that is very rare in someone from Dubai. Uh, that is modesty. Um, Dubai wants to be, aims to be, a global financial center. It is not yet that by quite a long way. We are not London. And what I shall be talking about is really our first steps in establishing ourselves as a financial center. What we think worked, what we think didn't work so well. But of course, with this bias on infrastructure, and I shall come back to some of the, the issues we discussed later. The first thing, just for those who don't know much about Dubai, The DIFC is the Dubai International Financial Center, and it's a purpose-built financial free zone. And I'll pick that up in a moment in Dubai, UAE. When I say purpose-built, when I first went to Dubai in October 2002, it was a patch of sand. In, on the third day of my visit, someone brought a soil testing rig onto that patch of sand. So very much a blank canvas in physical terms, and also, as we shall see, in legal and regulatory terms. It was created under federal law, which required the UAE to amend its constitution. And why did it need to do that? It was because the decision was made to disapply the normal civil and commercial laws of the UAE on this patch of land. That's an astonishingly radical thing for any jurisdiction to do. It's a bit like creating a new Vatican City in the middle of Rome, but not as something that has grown up there by history, but as a piece of new decision. And so we have our own legal system within the DIFC based on the sort of common law principles with which I'm familiar from England not on the civil law structure which exists in the rest of the country. To apply it, we have our own court system with an international panel of judges, the chief justices from Singapore. And of course, we have our own financial services regulator. That's what I work for. Just to talk a little bit about the infrastructure, this was the master plan And it is a master planned development. I'm not going to go through the detail of it, but just to show that some of it has been built, that's a fairly recent photograph. And of course, you will probably have seen images of the gate building. Incidentally, the fact that it has been built over that time, partly by the public sector, partly by the private, is a testimony to how fast Dubai can get on with things if it wants to. What you can't quite see here, by the way, is the new metro line, which runs just off the right-hand side of this picture. So what's the significance of this infrastructure? Well, there was a rather good paper published recently on clustering by Dr. Malcolm Cooper. And he distinguished a three-layer hierarchy of what needed to be in place in a financial center. And at the bottom of this is all the market infrastructure, all the physical stuff, transportation, buildings. And he concludes that although these are vital, they are not fundamentally sources of competitive advantage. The second layer are the institutions of the society. 
And the third is the marketplace itself, what goes on between the participants. These views are broadly in line with some from McKinsey, who ranked competitiveness factors with an eye to financial services by importance. And you can see what their hierarchy was. Infrastructure was coming about sixth out of 10. Okay, quality of life, real estate are treated a bit separately. But infrastructure, again, while important, is not actually the top of the list. My own personal conclusion it's, is that it's what the management theorists used to call a hygiene factor. It needs to be in place. It can kill you if you get it wrong, but it's not going to be your source of competitive advantage as compared with, well, whoever you think your competitors are, pretty much. But let me talk about what's happened in the DIFC. As I said, we had the advantage of a brown sand development, completely master planned, as a mixed use development. Um, I don't know how I get to that action button with this clicker, so can someone hit that action button for me, please? I don't have a full on mouse up here. But it's a mixed use development split between, thank you, between office space, which is what you'd expect to be there, residential, and then bits and pieces, hotel, retail. One of the aims in creating that kind of master plan was that Dubai didn't want a center that was going to be dead at night. Yeah, easy to do something that is a pure office development with a few coffee shops. But who will be there? How does that integrate into your urban fabric? As well as how do you get the supporting services? May I go back, please? I've got an, another action button down the bottom right, please. Now, one of the things that was built into this development was the idea that what we needed were modern buildings with large floor plates. Because people said, this is what financial services firms need. They need the large space for trading floors in particular. They want to put a lot of people in. They want to be flexible. And if I go to Canary Wharf, where I worked before I went to Dubai, yes, I, that's what I'd find. We actually found we got that a bit wrong. And we got it a bit wrong because actually people were coming into the center from new and global firms were putting a toe in the water. They were setting up offices, not with 500 people, but with five people. And what they actually wanted was small accommodation. Yeah, they wanted to know they didn't have to move far if they wanted to expand. But the, some of the big spaces actually had to be divided up. By the way, they weren't ideally designed for that. This is probably not an issue Istanbul will have with a huge existing amount of real estate of different generations and different sizes and spaces. But it is something to think about a bit. What about IT and communications? I'm not going to spend much time on that because actually it's now getting to be available in most urban centers. And it's stuff you can buy. It's sold on the world market. The equipment can be there. A competent telecoms company can install it. Getting it, except at the most extreme levels, is a matter of political and social will rather than expertise. Again, anyone can do it if they want to. And the only people who will need the extremes are, I suggest, a relatively few financial centers. Yeah, you will have real high-speed trading in London, New York, maybe Hong Kong. 
it's probably not going to be critical for Istanbul, certainly not for Dubai, to do that quickly. What about transport? Local transport systems, of course, are important. We've heard a lot about them today. Frankly, they are, to my mind, largely a quality of life issue. Yes, they can be critical to an area of the city. They are critical to the position of La Défense against the center of Paris. Certainly, they were critical in opening up Canary Wharf and making it competitive with the old city of London. But I doubt they will be your sources of international competitiveness, except in quality of life. For us, much more important has been regional and international connectivity. The reason for that is that if you're talking about a financial center that is more than a national one, then essentially people are going to be doing regional business out of it. And it's the attractions of Dubai, certainly, probably Istanbul, as a regional hub that are going to give them key advantages. We have been extremely lucky to have Emirates Airline and Dubai International Airport. It is easy to say to an American firm, yes, you can come into Dubai. You have direct flights from New York. And when you want to go on and visit your customers in Jordan or Bahrain or Mumbai, you can do it quickly and easily. I go to a fair number of international meetings. If I go to a meeting in Jordan and the Malaysians are there, quite likely I meet them at Dubai Airport on the way through. Similarly, if the meeting is in Malaysia, the Saudis will be passing through Dubai. That kind of connectivity, I think, is going to be absolutely critical. As for the rest, quality of life, it's a whole collection of things. I don't have time to describe them in detail. Very few of them, I suggest, are individually critical, though together they add up. Perhaps security and freedom from crime is the one that is, that is critical. Because in an international market, the fundamental question is, am I content to move here with my family? And if you can say to the guy in New York or Sydney or Tokyo, yes, this is a place where you will be comfortable, he won't be adding up the detail of, mm, does this have a better cultural life than that, though cultural life will weigh. Um, all he will, he will eventually make a decision, would I be comfortable? Not even, does you know, London have the edge over Paris or Amsterdam uh, or Madrid in terms of whether you're happy to live there? It's do you get over the threshold? In Dubai, we have been lucky. We have had a stable and secure environment. Frankly, that is by far the biggest advantage we have in the region. But I want to say a little bit about the other infrastructure issues. Because to me, the intangible infrastructure of business is going to be more important than the physical infrastructure. And that's a whole collection of things. Are the supporting professions here, yeah, the accountants, the actuaries, What's business education and training like? Frankly, started off not very good in Dubai, but it's been building up as part of what went on in the center. And we've been lucky in having a very fluid labor market, which makes it easy in the interim to import people. The courts, the legal system, that's a place where we have been different from the rest of the UAE, and frankly, different from most of the countries in the region. It's one of the things people say to us they like. And the regulatory framework, yeah, all right, I'm going to stop being b modest. Um, I think in the DFSA, we have done a pretty good job in constructing a regulatory framework comparable with those in Europe and with other developed centers. We often look at Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia as places against which we would benchmark ourselves, Canada perhaps. 
those, I think, are more important, really, than any of the physical stuff. And certainly, when we talk to the people who've come to Dubai so far, these are the things they've seen as the critical issues. We are running out of time, so I'm not going to spend long on this summary. But one point I will make is that what is a competitive advantage fundamentally depends on who the competition is. We in Dubai have so far prospered as a regional hub, as places where people put the headquarters that is going to serve some part of the MENA region for one or two companies, even a hemisphere. And for that, our competition has been the other countries of the region. Frankly, we have not been in competition with London or with Hong Kong in most respects, certainly not with New York. And the competitive advantages therefore need careful analysis of the competition and they may vary between sectors. I've made a few more points here, but let me go back to the question I was asked originally. When I went, to, what has changed between when I went to Dubai and when I came, well, when I went to Dubai, the creation of a financial center, there was an ambition. It had been announced earlier that same year, and there was a bit of sand that had a fence around it marked Dubai International Financial Center. We didn't have the regulatory institutions. We didn't have the legal structure. Nobody had sat down and written the new company law we needed, because the company's law of the UAE wasn't going to apply. No one had sat down and written employment law. Still less had they written a prudential regime for banks or about market conduct on an exchange. So we had to do this from scratch. Frankly, when I went there, I was prepared for the possibility of failure. Yeah. I said to myself, this could all go very pear-shaped in a year. I could be back in London. I'm still in Dubai after something like nine years, and it's because it's been possible to do those things. I will say also that in the early history of the center, we had a fright because we knew as a regulator that our independence and our freedom of operation was critical. A couple of years into the process, there was a major glitch, um, which frankly, made it look to us as though that independence was threatened. Fortunately, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, then the Crown Prince of Dubai, now its ruler, gave very strong guarantees on independence, which have been observed ever since. And we have been able to operate as the kind of financial services regulator that we wanted to be. Similarly, the courts have had their independence. If those things had not happened, we would have crashed and burned. And yeah, that we have come through that, I think, has been one of the most important things. What can I say about Istanbul as a foreigner? This is difficult for me because, look, I'm talking from, in a sense, an upstart city to a city that has been the capital of two great empires. Um, and that now yeah, is the financial center for a country of 70 odd million people, um, which has a domestic market that we don't have. The question that I think, uh, I I Istanbul can easily be a financial center serving those 70 million people, and, and that population is a huge advantage because people will come to Istanbul to do business with it. The question is what does it need to do to become first a regional and then a global center? Why will people serve a wider region from Istanbul and what will that region be? And I think that's one of the critical issues for you. Frankly, it depends also on your future in relation to the European community. If you are outside it, then you will be 
a kind of center for the countries that are outside it, but in your region, perhaps, but they will have other choices. I think if you are inside it, you will be quite an attractive point of entry to Europe for a number of countries outside. For the Levantine countries are obvious. The former Soviet states of the Caucasus are obvious. You may well be, for them, their comfortable way of doing business in Europe with the ability of establishing here and passporting in. Um, so the strategy, I think, will depend on where you wind up within Europe. Um, I would say that you know, I no lo I'm no longer working in Britain, I'm no longer an agent of the British government, but personally, I also hope that you will be inside, and I think the, the reasons that have kept Turkey out are frankly not strong ones in terms of Europe and in terms of the other countries that we, and I am a European after all, um, that we have within that empire. And if you are in, then I think your ability to be the bridge into Europe for the countries of the Levant and of the Caucasus will probably be your critical advantage. Thank you. YP Türkiye size çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Bu kapsamlı, detaylı e, sunumlarını bizle paylaştığı için. Son konuşmacımız Bay Wayne Evans. E, Bay Evans e, 2010 yılı Haziran'dan bu yana City UK'in e, dış ülkeler strateji e, direktörü olarak çalışıyor. Bu görevinden önce İngiltere merkezli ve 40 yıllık finans, finansal hizmetler tanıtım deneyimine sahip bir organizasyonda e, Londra Uluslararası Finans Hizmetleri Kurumu'nda yine Uluslararası Direktör olarak çalıştı. Bundan önce de Commonwealth, <coughs> Commonwealth Ofisi'nde ticaret promosyonu ve ekonomi ve politika stratejileri alanında çalıştı. E, kendisinden biz özellikle tabii City UK diğer şu ana kadarki e, katılımcılarımızdan farklı bir deneyim. O deneyimin farklılığını bizle paylaşmasını e, bekliyoruz. E, ayrıca bu özellikle birçok e, ülkeyle de diğer finans merkezleriyle de yakın işbirliği içerisindeler. Dolayısıyla İstanbul'un konumunu bu manada altyapı bağlamında bir değerlendirmesini kendisinden açıkçası bekliyorum. Bir de bu kümeleme konusundan e, bahsettik kısaca. E, Londra'da e, finans sektöründe çalışanların yüzde 66'sının Londra dışında yaşadığına dair bir bilgi var. Dolayısıyla bu boyutlarıyla e, aynı mekanda sektörün toplanmasının önemi konusunda da kendisinden bir değerlendirme bekliyorum. Buyurun Bay Evans. Thank you Mr. Under Secretary. I will uh, endeavor to answer some of your points as I go along as I as I speak. Um I am aware that I'm the last speaker and it's getting quite late. Um, I'm going to cut down my presentation because I find that uh, a lot of the things that I was going to say have been said by uh, previous speakers, so I will only be uh, reinforcing what they said. I'm also rather concerned that Peter's presentation is almost exactly the same as mine. So I, I, <laughs> I, think, I, think, we, I think our secretaries must have been talking, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll take away. Um, as, the, as the Under Secretary said, um, my name is... Uh, as the Under Secretary said, my name is Wayne Evans. I work for an organization called the City UK. We were only established in, ju in June 2010 um, as a response to the global financial crisis. So we've only, we only opened our doors last year. Um, my job as the head of the international uh, uh, uh, team is to, is to promote the, the City of London and the wider UK financial services industry overseas. Um, so maintaining London as an international financial <coughs> centre is key to my work. Um, and depending on uh, 
what index you look at, and I noticed my French colleague had us as number two, I would prefer that we were number one on the indexes that I look at. Um, uh, but, um, um, uh, but then I would say that. But I'm not here today to promote London as a financial centre. Um, I'm here to how we can help Istanbul. Um, but if I refer to London, it's a, as an example. Um, while it's good to be number one or, or number two, what really matters is the volume of business. And to grow business and to grow the global economy, uh, we need to grow other international financial centres. So we're not afraid in London of the development of other international financial centres. In fact, we think it's, it's key. It's key to the global economy. As proof of this, two weeks ago, I signed in the Kremlin in front of the British Prime Minister and the Russian President uh, a, a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, with our Russian partners to develop Moscow as an international financial centre. And believe me, Moscow has got far more problems than, than, than those facing you in, in Istanbul, but we believe that they should also be encouraged to, to develop their financial centre. So that's why I'm pleased to hear today to develop relations between London and Istanbul. <coughs> I hope that one day we will sign a similar agreement with Istanbul uh, so to develop Istanbul uh, as, a, as a regional and then an international financial centre. My visit to Turkey has been part of a wider business delegation with uh, Dr. Vince Cable, our business minister. Some of you may have heard him uh, speak this morning. And uh, actually, I'm going to take that opportunity to, to uh, challenge Dr. Cable. As an ex-civil servant, I'm always a bit anxious about criticising a minister, and I'm sure the Under-Secretary uh, knows about that. But I'm no longer a civil servant, and Dr. Cable is out of the country, so I'm quite free, free to um, be rude about him now. Um, <laughs> Dr. Cable is, a, is very negative about the UK financial services industry. Um, it's a very popularist vote in, in, in the UK at the moment, and, and he, he's got genuine reasons. Um, but I'd just like to pick him up on, on, on one point he said uh, this morning. He said that uh, London, uh, the UK financial services are a major exporter. He was wrong. Financial services in the UK are the largest uh, net exporter. It's our largest exporting industry. In fact, it's larger than all our, <coughs> all our other exports <coughs> put together. Last year, it was about £40 billion. Pounds. So it's key to the UK. But I think it's also key to Turkey, Dubai. It's, it's a key business, and, and, and, you, and you have to be part of it. Anyway, back to the subject. So why is London a success and not Tokyo? Uh, what, what, what, what can Istanbul learn from, from our experience? Well, if I look at London, you know, if I look at Lloyd's, the largest uh, insurance and reinsurance market, um, they've been going for over 320 years. One company has been going for 320 years in financial services. Our stock exchange has been going for 120 years longer than Lloyd's, so our legal systems go back even before then. So history could be a factor, but I don't think it is. Um, and, and Dubai is, and Bahrain and Shanghai are clear evidence of that, that they've all grown as financial centres in the last 30 years. But I think there are a number of factors that any financial services uh, centre needs, and I've, I've broken it down to four basic requirements. First of all, you need a vision and a will to succeed, and we're seeing signs of that today uh, here in Istanbul. But this, has to be s this vision has to be set and supported by the government, who sometimes will have to make decisions that are not popular. Someone has to drive the vision and encourage the market to grow. Um, a second uh, key factor is a business and social culture that encourages foreign investment, encourages foreigners to come to your country, and again, other colleagues have spoken about that. The third is... Uh, a key requirement is an educated local workforce. And finally, of course, an infrastructure, which we've been talking about, uh, an infrastructure that will support a growing industry. And the, the physical infrastructure is perhaps the easiest part, and, and, and, and Peter's already alluded to that. Of course, you have to have the right buildings, the right high-speed internet, transport, transport infrastructure, housing, IT, etc. And you also keep you have to keep improving them as the industry grows. Uh, London's financial centre was traditionally the square mile, but over 30 years ago, it was realised that this, there was simply not enough space in the square mile to, to, to, to capture the, the, the British industry. So a complementary new development was built at Canary Wharf. A new financial centre sprung up, uh, sprung up there. Physically, it's, it's similar to, the, to Dubai, to the DIFC. It's quite probably not as large, but... <laughs> But interestingly, for both Canary Wharf and the DIFC, new legislation and laws have to be enacted to allow them to be established. 
also, like the DIFC, it's not just about offices. You, you have to create a whole infrastructure around it, shops, hotels, bars, restaurants, cinemas. My family go shopping at the uh, Canary Wharf at the weekends. My, my children uh, go to the bars there in the evening. So it, it's, it's, it's more than just a business centre. <coughs> Um, but infrastructure is not enough. Um, there is a common misquote I I from a film that Kevin Costner starred in called uh, uh, Field of Dreams, and, and that quote was, build it and they will come. We might build a centre, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people will come. Um, it might apply to a baseball sta stadium, but it doesn't apply to a, a financial services industry. So government backing is crucial, um, not just in the infrastructure, your minister, your minister of economy this morning mentioned that uh, business flows. Well, in my experience uh, over many years of, of this, foreign investment and business flows like water. It flows to where the least, where it's the least resistance. At the moment, any foreign bank can set up in the UK provided it meets our regulatory requirements. So can any law firm, and so can any accountancy practice. Our government decided many years ago that the UK should be open for business, and I think that's key. Sadly, many countries still put up trade barriers and have protecti protectionist measures in place. <coughs> to, to encourage growth in financial services, the government has to ensure that there are no obstacles to trade. They may have to make decisions that are unpopular in the short term with parts of their domestic business. Multilateral trade agreements can be a way to get around this. Uh, they can remove the barriers. And I would like to compare now the EU-Korea and the EU-India free trade agreements. The EU Korea Free Trade Agreement has recently been finalised and we've already seen that foreign business and investment is flowing into the area, it's moving into the area. The EU India Free Trade Agreements started at the same time and remained bogged down. One of the key stumbling blocks is that, uh, with the Indians is that they, they make it very difficult for international law firms to operate there, mainly because, and I'll be quite frank here now, vested interests of a, full, a small number, four or five Indian law firms. Our research has shown that, one, that not one local lawyer has lost their job because of the opening up of markets to international law firms. Indeed, job opportunities in law have grown. Complicated international trade needs good lawyers, and it follows that an international financial figure needs good international instrument help. So the government has to, uh, and the host city, have to foster a culture that encourages foreign companies to set up there. And this is where the business and social culture also has to be right. Today, successful companies and young, talented people, but certainly in the West, have lost their hometown loyalties. A good example is, is, is France. London is now the seventh largest French city. There are more, there are more after, the, after the six top cities, there are more people, more people, French people than living in London. So businesses and people can choose to cluster. The, the cluster point is very key on, on, on people growing. Uh, people can be people and companies can be choose to be fleet of foot and head for new opportunities. They can choose any country, any region, and any city that is attractive. A city with distinctive characteristics, and although this is my first visit to Istanbul, I've only been here less than 24 hours, I can see that it is an attractive <coughs> place to come and live. But cities need distinctive characteristics, be they economic, cultural, environmental, or to do with lifestyle and family. Those that are will attract the best companies and the best people. There are, of course, also a number of other hard factors central to the success of the city. These are tax, tax rates, regulatory policy, policy, and the supervisory approach, <coughs> immigration <coughs> policy, and an openness to foreign ownership. Apart from uh, the last one, the British government is doing its best to, to uh, hold us down on tax rates, regulatory policy, and supervisory supervisory approach. So I decided that anybody is holding back the UK as a financial centre, it's our own government. But cultural factors are of equal importance. New research is starting to show the true impact of these elements. Top factors such are lifestyle choice and an enjoyable place to work and socialise. Peter has also touched on this. Something to do after the office closes and at weekends. Shops, restaurants, sports, entertainment as well as more cultural pursuits. And family friendliness, Peter also touched on this more than just good access to education and <coughs> facilities for children, but also the culture of the city. Factors such as safety and crime also come into play. So let's assume that you get all this in Istanbul and that, that you're, you're working towards it. Um, what's left? Well, expatriate workers are expensive. I've been an expatriate. 
he had to pay me a lot of money to go and live and work in Saudi Arabia. So you, and you also want to create local jobs for local people. So you must have a good locally educated workforce. In the UK, we have the gift of the English language as the world business language. Yet students of history will know that Latin was in use for far, more, far longer than English has been. With the rise of the Asian markets, even English may pass, but for the moment we have, must have an educated workforce who speaks of English. But not just English, they must have an appropriate skill. The available of skilled staff locally is a key factor in location decisions. This is particularly the case for emerging centres like we hope Istanbul, Istanbul will be. Locations where businesses are most likely to be considering opening new offices or expanding their operations are in the new market. A survey co co conducted by Ipsos Mori with the City of London found that the uh, availability of local, ta local talent is a key factor for businesses when deciding where staff and operations can and cannot be moved. Decisions make point of decision makers point out that if the depth of local talent and former trainees and support staff is available in a particular location, then moving their key operations to that loca location becomes cost effective and easier to do. So you must have a good local workforce. Um, in light of these considerations, there is a distinct trend towards emerging centres actively seeking to enhance the depth of local talent. And, and Peter's also mentioned this in, in the context of Dubai. This is not just a function of government efforts to improve education locally, but also as a consequence of businesses themselves realising the advantages of training local staff. Many decision makers argue that it's cheaper and more effective to have employers who understand local and, and cultural business. Finally, it is also increasingly important to, for business growth and success to have local knowledge at senior levels as well. This provides not just linguistic and communication skills, but also increased knowledge of and access to local markets. It's clear that all of you in, in, in, in, in, uh, here in Istanbul will have better connections than any British expatriate put, put posted out to, to, to work in Istanbul. So developing the local talent at, at the lower levels and the senior levels is crucial. So I believe that there is no one factor that will make a city a successful financial centre but there are lots of factors that will make it unsuccessful. I believe that Turkey has many of the required factors to make, it make Istanbul a success, and with a bit of drive, Istanbul will grow into a regional and then an international financial centre. Thank you. To answer... To answer your questions on, on infrastructure development in London and commuting in and out of London, you're right. I live in, in, in what is called a, a dormitory town. Um, people go there to sleep at night and come back to work in London. Um, it's about 40 kilometres south of London. But I can step out of my door in the morning um, and where I live, I step out and there are rabbits and there are deer and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's a green environment. But I, I can step out my door in the morning at 7 o'clock I can work, walk into my office at 8 o'clock. Door to door, it's about 40 kilometres. So you have to have that good infrastructure for moving people in and out. And living out of London, it's certainly cheaper, the environment's nicer, my family are in a, in a better environment. So, yes, yeah, so, so transport's important. And London, you know, and, and I'm, I'm a great proponent of London, London has a creaking infrastructure, the tube system, because it is so old. It's, it's, it, it, it is not built for a modern city. So that, and that is another great advantage where Istanbul, Shanghai, uh, uh, Sao Paulo, are developing new metro systems, Dubai, with, with, the, with the, like the Yoga Railway, it's far better than we've got in London. So that's a great advantage that we have. We can't really improve the, the, the metro systems much more than it is, but, you know, so, so they are, they are, we are doing what we can, but the, you know, the new centres do have a distinct advantage over us. However, we have also noticed that um, the, the sort of east-west route, the west-east route across London, uh, connecting Heathrow, the city, and Canary Wharf, was uh, incredibly slow. It, you know, you, to get to Canary Wharf from Heathrow could take you two hours. So well, there's a massive uh, infrastructure program going on at the moment in London called Crossrail, and that will halve that time or even quarter it with, with high-speed trains. So even London as an established um, financial centre um, still needs to keep improving its infrastructure just to maintain our position and just to, to keep us competitive. Evet, teşekkür ediyoruz Bay Wayne Evans. Şimdi 
oldukça geç oldu. Fazla tutmak istemiyorum ama e, katılımcılardan konuklarımıza soru yöneltmek isteyen varsa o sorular almak istiyorum. Buyurun. Ve e, belli bir konuğumuza yöneltiyorsanız ismini de söylerseniz. Yeah, I would like to um, you know, ask the question uh, to the floor. You know, I think um, once you, you said Moscow and Istanbul, is it going to be a crea a creating a conflict or interest to deal with Moscow and Istanbul in the same time? And the second one is, I think the concentrated uh, information was uh, surrounded around cultural industries, like in, in, you know, bec uh, bec uh, or next to infrastructure or human talent, I would like to bring cultural industries. As you said, when I step out of my door, out of my office, what would my family do? Uh, you know, uh, how do you compare? I know Istanbul has a, you know, centuries of history, but in comparisons to Shanghai bringing in, in uh, let's say, museums, importing museums, Manchester, you know, converting old factories into cultural centers, Dubai, and uh, Singapore. In terms of cultural industries, what can Istanbul do more in order to compete and be ahead of competition uh, you know, in comparison to other uh, financial centers? Well, I'll take the first one. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Microphone, please. Sorry. I'll take the first point, if I may, about growing financial centers. Um, I, I think it's important for the global economy to grow, grow financial services. If we say that the current um, uh, size of the global uh, financial service business is the first two rows of this, of this auditorium, so that's about 40 seats, and London has uh, a quarter of it, so that's 10 seats, that's fine. But what we want to do is grow the, grow, the, the, the grow the cake bigger so that it's not just the first two rows of this auditorium, it's the next four rows or the next six rows. And by developing Shanghai, uh, Istanbul, Moscow, uh, and, and developing those markets, then we might only have, still only have 25% of the cake, but it'll be a much bigger cake. It'll be, it won't be just that row, it'll be the tw a share of, of, of, of, of four, four or eight rows. So uh, I think it's quite important, you know, if you look at Russia, the size of the market there, it's huge. Um, and that market is going to need financial services. If you look at um, um, India, there are a huge number of people who are unbanked. There are certainly vast numbers of people um, who, are, who are uninsured. And, um, you know, and again, in, in countries um, where there is a growing middle class, they want middle class financial services products. They want, you know, they want life insurance. They want health insurance. Uh, they want to buy bonds that are safe to invest in. So there are huge untapped markets out there, which are going to grow um, um, um, uh, in those markets. And and uh, and I think we should all take a, a share in developing that, that market. So I don't see uh, uh, growing Moscow or growing Istanbul or, or growing. Uh, uh, Rio as, uh, as a threat to, uh, to any other markets. And, and, and as Peter says, there's also a, an interconnection. You know, you, um, Istanbul may have a, a, an advantage over um, other parts of the world for this region, and I hope that will be the case. Bahrain is very good on insurance in, in, in the GCC. So, so there, are, there, are, there, are, there are, I think there are plenty of opportunities, and we haven't even got onto Islamic finance yet. I nearly got an invitation there to my specialist subject, <laughs> but to, for which thank you. But uh, what I wanted to comment on was actually the experience as an expatriate of what makes me comfortable to live and work somewhere. And when I was in London, the things I loved doing were going to the theater, um, music, singing a bit, uh, and actually at the weekends, walking in the Surrey Hills. I've moved to Dubai. Um, 
Dubai just doesn't have the topography to go walking. Nothing you can do about it, it's nature. Dubai has very little theater. It has some music and I've done some of that. But what I have found is that I've spent my time, spent time on other things. Dubai has great restaurants and I've eaten more good meals there than I would ever get round to in the same time in London. I've been to some top level sporting events. I had never watched professional golf before I went to Dubai. Done it, found it can entertain me. So that says to me that, you know, for me as an expatriate, um, it's not that there are one or two bits of the cultural life I have to have. They can, to some extent, be traded against each other. The things I probably do need and without which I wouldn't I would be very uncomfortable there, are yeah, basic security and freedom from crime and corruption. You know, the idea that the police will protect you um, and they won't be trying to shake you down, that, uh, that is a minimum. And for me personally, the ability as a Christian to worship freely. I would have had trouble going to any place where I couldn't have done that. Again, not an issue in European cities in general, um, but something competitive. I'm sure most people have one or two things that are the minimum, but a fair amount of flexibility among the rest. Yes, Dubai would have a better cultural life, for example, if it had a few decent museums. It's got one small one and some passable art galleries. But, you know, when I think when I'm in London, when I was working in London, how often did I go to the great museums of London? Not really all that often. Um, yes, few times a year. Probably those things are not going to be critical for expatriate life. But being comfortable to live here with your family is really what it comes to. If I may just add to that, and I would confirm exactly what Peter said, um, I've been an expatriate in, in seven countries overseas, um, and um, one of the most difficult uh, was Saudi Arabia, and I actually love Saudi Arabia, I'm very positive about Saudi, I think it's a great place, but it's a hard place to live, and it's a hard place to ex uh, attract um, expatriates to go and work there. Um, one of the highlights for me actually was uh, driving along the Hejaz Railway, which I think you uh, chaps in this room may have had a little bit to do in the construction of it. Um, I won't go any further on that because we've got a history there as well. But, um, but you know, you find things to do, but in a hard environment, and, and, and uh, as Peter said, there's no Christian worship in Saudi Arabia. You know, it puts people off. So I, I, I think what you need is, is a, a, an atmosphere which is uh, welcoming to foreigners and, and, and, and foreigners will find their own things to do they'll find their own interests and they'll find their own culture and they'll find culture within your own culture um, but you, you've got to have a welcoming environment and I, I think Turkey's got that and my, my, my, my, my experience of Turkey is that you, know, you have got that and you are open to foreigners and, and, and so uh, you know, I think you're starting off with an advantage Thank you My question is to Mr. Evans. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, innovation. Uh, how do you specifically manage that for London? I think you have to keep uh, reinventing yourselves. You have to keep looking for new ideas. And, and, and Dr. Cable touched on it this morning. That you know, with some of our innovation, we probably got ahead of the game, and, and in the financial crisis, got burnt. But I think you have to keep looking at. Uh, what the next agenda is um, um, again whether it's Islamic finance or whether it's uh, carbon trading carbon markets there are a whole uh, you know we've just opened up a green bank in the UK so I think you have to keep looking at where the opportunities are what what other people are doing and again the clusters point is very important in that because uh, where we're trying to place London now is you know you might be a Chinese company buying iron ore from Brazil but you've got to put it on a ship 
um, and you, you might hire, and we hope that you'll hire that ship through uh, the Maritime London. You've got to insure your cargo, and we hope that you will do that through Lloyd's or, or, or an insurance broker. Um, you know, if you get into a dispute, which can happen, you know, we hope that you'll come to London as, as a dispute resolution centre. So it's about being open to ideas and about um, continually finding ways to, to, to, uh, to, to develop your business. Teşekkürler. Buyurun hanımefendi siz mikrofonu verebilirsek ortadaki hanımefendi. Elinizi kaldırırsanız. Um, my question is also to Mr. Evans. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, you talked about the people are living outside London, but uh, my question is whether uh, that is in choice of life, you know, living outside in green places or having a bigger house, or is it that the uh, living inside the city, is it actually affordable? I mean, that may not be a problem for people in for upper classes and working in the uh, you know upper level in the financial sector. But I think there are also many people that are middle, you know, upper middle income people also working for financial sector. So, uh, what do you do to um, support such people living inside the city? Because my friends coming from you know outside. They're always like, you know, I like Istanbul. It's very nice city. You know, I want to live in the city. So, what do you do for that? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Peter's going to help me out with this one, but I, um, I, I, there was two things there. Again, I think it's <coughs> I think I think it's probably where Istanbul may have an advantage over London. Um, London accommodation is expensive. I think that, that, that is one of our uh, things that we recognize as, as a negative. Also, it's um, old people like me who live outside London, so you know you don't need a social life so much. Um, my two young daughters live in London in flats which they share with other friends. Um, so, and, it's, it's a, it's a, and London is a great place for young people. But you're, you're right, you are right, it, it, is, an, it, is, it is an issue. Um, there's not so much social housing as there used to be. Um, and um, you know, so there's not so much cheap uh, accommodation on the market, but um, people survive. So I, I guess it, I guess it must be working. But it, it, it's uh, it, it is it is it is an issue. For what it's worth, um, my daughter is working in financial services in London in an IT job with Deutsche Bank, um, and she and her husband have a house in the Isle of Dogs, sort of 15, 20 minutes from Canary Wharf. Now, they have chosen, I think, to put their, to put their money there and accept less space than they would get if they lived further out, but it seems to work. As it happens, I own a flat nearby, which is where, where I stay when I visit London. And when I'm in that building, I see quite a lot of young professionals. Um, incidentally, many of them foreign, I suspect, you know, expats working in London, um, you know, just going up and down in the lift. So it can be done, but what you end up doing in London is trading space against location. And typically, once families start having children, they then move further out for, for space. And that's an, that's an issue for all big cities. Now, I don't know how well in Istanbul housing is integrated into the fabric of the city. Uh, and it may well be that that's something you've got going for you. Uh, but yeah, if you're gonna have an hour's journey to work, then there better be something to make it worthwhile. Evet, teşekkür ediyoruz. Gördüğüm kadarıyla başka soru Murat Bey. Evet. Buyurun Murat Bey. Çok hoş. Murat Bey, başka var mı? Öyle mi? Evet, Murat, Murat, evet peki. Arkadaki Bey, buyurun. Thank you all for the very nice presentation, uh, everyone 
on the panel. I have a question regarding the rule of law in terms of enforcement of contracts. Uh, from what we can see is that in Turkey, a lot of contracts, the court proceedings, uh, the way court measures take place, they take a lot of time. So is this a hindrance in terms of Istanbul being uh, financial capital in the essence that the government wants it to be? And also labor laws and flexibility. So for example, if you're work working in the city of London or if you're working in the United States on Wall Street, you can be fired and your contract will be terminated the next day without a lot of uh, repeal in the sense. Is this something that also is very important for the financial system to develop? Especially, let's say, in the case of Dubai, enforcement of contracts, the legal proceedings, rule of law. How important are these factors for the um, economic side and businesses that are in the financial industry moving towards these hubs? Thank you. This is for everyone on the floor, basically. Kim dediniz? Herkes olabilir. Okay, let me let me see if I can kick off a bit of this um, about Dubai. When, as I've said, when the financial center was established, a clear decision was made at the highest level of the UAE government to allow it to develop a separate legal system based on common law and with its own court. And that was because that was seen as a critical area of, of advantage for Dubai. And I think it was recognized that the courts of the UAE had very little experience of resolving complex financial disputes. So essentially experienced judges were brought in from a number of places around the world, UK, Singapore, Malaysia, New Zealand. Uh, and at the same time, you know, some Emiratis were brought in to develop as judges. But I can only say that for us, that aspect of speedy access to a court of justice that understands financial law was seen as one of the things we needed to be in place. I cannot, uh, I do not know enough about the Turkish system to know whether there is an issue there or not. Uh, I would, I, I share that view. I mean, uh, I don't really know about the system in, here in Turkey, but I suspect it may be a, a loaded question. So, um, but what I would say is that um, the week that I signed the MOU in Moscow, uh, British Petroleum's, or BP as they're now called, uh, BP's offices were raided um, and for no clear legal reason. And so I had a lot of uh, criticism why we were trying to develop Moscow as a financial center when they had uh, no respect for business law. And, and the answer is that the reason we're trying to develop Moscow as a financial center is that to establish a sort of framework, and we have six work streams, including one on legal, uh, and one on regulation, where this sort of thing doesn't happen. It can't happen anymore. And there are a number of people in power in, in, in, in, in Russia who want to move to that. So so you're right. I mean, it, it is an issue. You have to have due, due diligence and due process. But uh, it's something that, as, as, as, as, uh, as countries mature, that, that, they, they, that, they, that sort of gets out of their system, I think. Um, what was the other part of the question? Sorry, what was the second part of your question? Labor flexibility. Um, again, it's it, it's quite an issue, but it's certain. I don't know about Dubai, but in in certain UK, there are clear labor laws, and and there the, you know and they have to be uh, um, ab uh, adhered to. Having said that, I've spent most of my career in the government, where as a, as a civil servant, where it's very hard to sack people. Uh, since working in the city, I've noticed that they go quite quickly. Um, I think the difference is that they get paid off better. But um, it, it, it, it, it, uh, there are like labor laws that you have, to, you have to obey. Dubai is a highly atypical place um, because, again, the UAE made a decision to run an economy hugely greater than it could run on its indigenous population. 
And so, you know, you have a country with a population of five, six million, of whom maybe 15% are citizens of the country, um, and a smaller proportion in the working ages. And the vast majority of people who work there, therefore, are expatriates of one kind or another, you know, whether it's me as uh, a reasonably well-paid Westerner or the Bangladeshi who's digging the roads. And because of that, labor law is really rather extraordinary. And if we are no longer employed, we are expected to leave the country. We are, and I choose these words carefully, guest workers there. Um, and so labor law, I mean, there is labor law and there are protections but it's a very, very unusual labor market, and I don't think you would extrapolate that to you know, a country of 70-odd million citizens where the number of expatriates working is likely always to be a relatively small proportion. Thank you very much. Of course, there is a little bit of a burden of the law, but I want to give you a little bit of a e, bilgi vereyim. Özellikle iş kanunu e, ve iş esnekliği hususunda iş kanunu konusunda şunu açıkça söyleyebilirim ki Türkiye hakikaten e, ILO standartlarında e, kendi gelişmiş düzeyine paralel olarak özellikle iş kanunu ve iş hayatının düzenlenmesiyle ilgili çok ileri aşamalarda olan görece bir ülke. Fakat bu Tabii finans sektöründe özellikle bizim bugüne kadarki deneyimimiz e, önemli bir sorun olmadığı yönünde. Özellikle kayıt dışı olmadıkça bu alanlarda bu tür e, düzenlemeler oldukça uluslararası standartlarda ve özellikle çalışanı olsun, çalışanı koruyucu e, mahiyette. Esneklik konusuna gelince e, bu konuda Türkiye son e, beş yıldır yeni düzenlemeler yaptı. E, kısa süreli geçici istihdam e, konusunda ya da esneklik konusunda biliyorsunuz fidan tazminatı olsun e, işverene yük getiren e, e, konularda olsun yeni düzenlemeler <gülüyor> yapıldı. E, Tabi bu özellikle sosyal taraflarla müzakere edilerek e, yapılan bir e, süreç, geçirilen bir süreç. E, önümüzdeki günler ve e, aylarda da sa sanıyorum e, önemli adımlar atılacak bu konuda. Ama esneklik konusunda özellikle uygulamanın biraz daha hem çalışanların hem işverenlerin e, bu yeni bir kültüre e, alışmaları biraz zaman alacak diye düşünüyorum. Evet ben e, katılımcılarımız Sayın Adem Baştürk'e Sayın Peter Casey'e, Sayın Wayne Evans'a çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ayrıca sizler bu vakte kadar kalıp e, bu paneli izlediğiniz için, ilgiyle izlediğiniz için, sorularınız için ve bu deneyimi paylaştığınız için ve son olarak da bu organizasyonu düzenleyen e, P Global ve 724. Ee, ve çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Özellikle bunu ben e, kendi kurumum adına, kendi misyonum e, adına da özellikle teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Çünkü İstanbul'un bir finans merkezi, uluslararası bir finans merkezi haline gelmesi için son iki yıldır yapılan bu faaliyet hakikaten bizler için çok güzel bir ortam hazırlıyor. E, ve bu tür panellerle ve e, uluslararası deneyime sahip konuşmalar konuşmacılar ile böyle bir ortamı sağlıyor. Bunun için de ayrıca kendilerine çok teşekkür ediyorum. Hepinize iyi akşamlar diliyorum.